from the context, it seems that somehow or other they're talking about spiritual warfare and casting out demons, and they're trying to figure out what went wrong. Something weird happened. If you want to turn with me, we're in Mark 9. You can check it out on your Bible. If you've got a flat screen device, you can pull it up on that. If you need a Bible, throw your hand up. We'll bring you one. We got that on its way. Mark 9, we're in verse 14. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. Now they think, not only is the, is the man here, the prophet, this Messiah supposedly, but now they walk up and what they're expecting to find is that Jesus is going to be the guy who's going to be able to answer their questions for them, who's going to be able to handle this discussion because it's not going well at the moment. He says, what are you arguing with them about? Here's the thing. When Jesus asks a question, just so you know, it's not because he doesn't know the answer, but he wants you to be able to explain the answer. It's kind of like, like all the way back in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve sin. They eat the apple. Well, Eve eats the apple, and then she hands it to Adam. He has some too. And then they go, dang, we're naked. And they hide. And then God comes walking through the garden. And he's like, hey, Adam, where are you? Like he knows where they are. He wasn't confused about where they'd gone off to. He just, he wants them to admit it. And he's giving them a chance to fess up. And then they, they're kind of idiots about the whole thing. So Jesus asks, not because he doesn't know what they're doing. He already knows this. He's got all this information. He's got the power to fully know exactly what's already happening. But he wants them to explain what they think is the issue. So somebody asks, or somebody says, a man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought my son who is possessed by a spirit, demon, who is, po is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground, and he foams at the mouth and gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they couldn't. Like, this is some serious junk. Like, hey, we, we're, we're followers of that. Like, imagine how this looked. Like, Peter walks up. To everybody, he's like, what's up, everybody? Jesus is on his way. Like, because he's always walking around boasting and bragging. He's super stoked that he gets to hang out with Jesus all the time because it makes him look cool. And so he's all pumped. He's blowing it up. And then all of a sudden, some guy walks up, and he's like, where? Where's Jesus? He's like, oh, he's, he's still coming. He's in the next town, but he'll be here in a minute. He just stopped to pray and fast, like out in the woods. Don't worry about it. He'll be here in a little bit. But we showed up early just to prepare the way because that's what we do. We're cool like that. And the guy's like, oh, that's awesome. You're with Jesus? He's like, yeah, I'm with Jesus. And he's like, awesome. My son is possessed by a demon. Fix it. Oh, yeah, no, that's cool. I got this. Um, hold up. I got a stretch. And, and they try it, and they can't do anything about it. And the kid's like having seizures and throwing himself on fire. And, like, trying to drown himself, he, like, runs around crazy and then, like, dives into the lake head first and just sits there. Like, the demon, like, is trying to kill this boy. And they, like, pull him back out. And then the little boy is, like, fighting him off. And they can't do anything about it. And they're, like, in the name of our master, come out. And the demon's, like, up yours. And, then, like, like no, it doesn't work at all. They just get punked. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. And imagine them all standing there like, yeah, sorry, Jesus. He's right. We tried, and we just couldn't. Do I don't know what happened. Like, imagine how, if you were Peter, like, if you're the guy who walks into town, because Peter's kind of always doing these knuckleheaded, like, yo, I'm with Jesus. And then he gets humbled like that. Jesus gets kind of upset. Oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long should I put up with you? Bring me the boy. So they brought him. When the, when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked the boy's father, 
Jesus doesn't go like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? Which is probably what the disciples did. Like they saw that and Peter's like, I got this. And he's like, cast the demon out of my boy. And he's like, he's probably just sick. It's fine. And then he comes, he's all like, you know, I'm like spitting at him like the exorcist. And, you know, and then Peter's like, oh my, James, you handle it. You got this. James, John, you want to be at his right hand? Deal with it. I can't. But Jesus just looks at him, he's like, oh, wow, how long has he been like that? Just fix it. But Jesus is super calm about it. How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. And it's often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. <laughs> if you can, said Jesus. He quotes it like, like, wait, did you just say, if I could do it to me? Seriously? Like, like, I wonder, like, if everything that's rolling through his head, like, in that question is, like, you do realize that if I'm who I say I am, I'm the one who said, let there be light, and it started to exist for the first time, right? If I could do this, like, this, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God as Jesus, Everything that was created was made through him, and without, except through him, there was nothing made that was made. Everything was made through Jesus. If you can manage to handle this thing, maybe you could help him. Jesus says, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed to him, Man, and this right here. I do believe. Help my unbelief. Man, I do believe, but I know I'm a little short. Help me. Help me get there, Jesus. Like, I believe this can happen, but I, I don't know what's going wrong. And this has been happening since my boy was small. And your disciples just tried this. And they hang with you all the time. And they couldn't do it. I want to believe that you can do this. Help me. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, oh, he killed him. He said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet. And he stood up. Then Jesus went inside. This is weird. Jesus does that. This whole crowd shows up and he's like, okay, look, all the spectators are going to be here. This is going to be a big spectacle. Jesus isn't looking for the big spectacle. That's everybody else's gig. Jesus is like, ah, oh, shoot, everyone's coming. Hang on. Get out. The spirit leaves. And he's like, and then people are like, oh my gosh, he's dead. And like, no, he's not dead. He picks him up. He walks around. He's like, all right, you're cool. And then he goes inside and like hides from everybody. But then the disciples pull him aside, and they're like, Jesus, why couldn't we drive it out? And he says, this kind can come out only by prayer. Another version of it says prayer and fasting. That's a weird story. And then think about how that went. At what point in here did you see Jesus pray? Jesus walks up on a crowd who's arguing. He says, hey, what's going on? Like, if I'm Jesus right now, I will play the part of Jesus. Watch how much I pray. Ready? Hey, people, what's going on? Oh, there's all this stuff. And then like, this guy, hey, my son's possessed by a demon. Oh, crazy. Your disciples can't cast him out. All right, bring me the boy. Oh, wow, that's nuts. How long has he been doing that? I don't know, since he was a kid. All right, well, I could, you know, I can fix him. What do you mean, what if I can fix him? I can fix him. Check it out. Get out. He's gone. See? All better. How much of that... There was like no prayer in there at all. Have you guys ever seen The Exorcist? Anybody ever watch any of that craziness? Okay. You know, like they have all the rituals and they got like some crazy, like some bread and some salt and some holy water that some dude blessed in the Himalayas with a one-legged, one-eyed monk or something. I don't know. And like they got everything else and they got all the things and they put it on the people and then they're like... Oh and spew green vomit everywhere and like all the things and it's just crazy and they got to do like 
the, the blood of Jesus compels you. And like all the, thi- they got to do all this craziness. And then they go through all this ritual and the demon's still like, ah, and cusses at him. And stuff. Like, oh, well, wait, I, you didn't say it right. You got to do it a different way. Like you got to get all the rituals correct. Like what's the right, what's the right spell to cast out the demon? Like that's how we treat it. Like, I got to know the right prayer. Like, praying to God is like spell casting. Like, you got to level up. You can't be a level one wizard and pull this junk off. You got to be like seventh year wizard at Hogwarts Academy of Spirit Praying, and then you can cast out that demon. But it's not about that. Jesus didn't even pray. But then when they go like, what was different? How did you do that? How come we can't do that? This kind only comes out through prayer and fasting. What the? You, uh, you didn't do that. You didn't stop and be like, what's happening to your kid? Dang, that looks hard. Hang on. I'll be back in three days. I'm going to go fast for a while. Fasting is not eating for like a significant amount of time. Like he didn't walk away and not eat for a few days and then come back and be like, he's still doing that? Doesn't he ever stop? That's just weird, man. Like, I think Jesus was late to this party, this gathering. The disciples got there first because Jesus has a habit. If you read through the Gospels, Jesus has a habit of wandering off to pray by himself. When you look through the Gospels, you repeatedly find Jesus going away for prayer. Not just giving in to everything that the people ask of him. He does amazing miracles and then he leaves. He goes up to pray by himself. It happened when he fed the 5,000. He fed 5,000 people. And he prayed. I mean, in that moment, he, like, prayed for the food. It wasn't anything crazy. He was just like, God, thank you for this bread. It's awesome. I love that you made bread and fish because they taste good. And then he starts breaking them, and he starts handing it out, and it goes everywhere. Like, it wasn't a complicated prayer. He didn't, like, shoulda bought a Honda, bada bada Hyundai, and then, like, handed out the bread. Like he didn't have to do magic words or anything. It wasn't like a vada cabretta. It was just <laughs> my kids are really into Harry Potter right now, so <laughs> watching and reading those a lot. Jesus just had this lifestyle of prayer all the time. He had this lifestyle of fasting and being close with God. It says that he would do things, then he would pull away from the crowds. Like, he wasn't afraid of people. He's, it, like, I've heard some people try to say, like, now because, like, the introvert thing is such a big deal. They're like, Jesus was an introvert. Look, he ran away every time there was a crowd. I'm like, no. He hung out. He healed the people. He hung out with these 12 guys all the time. Like, he was amongst the people all the time. But we all need to recharge a bit. And and he had a lifestyle of like, he goes and does the things, but then he takes time. And sometimes when everybody's still asking for stuff, sometimes he just turns and like, there's lots of people still waiting to be healed. And he's like, nah, I gotta go. And he wanders off and like goes and prays by himself somewhere. And he leaves people who weren't healed yet. And he leaves people who are still demon possessed. And he leaves people who are still sick. And he leaves people who are still blind and still crippled and still broken. But he gets himself right. Like he knows Not doing the prayer thing means that he doesn't get to do the other thing. And part of that, like, sure, he's freaking God. If he wanted to, he could push through and just do it. But part of his existence on this earth was showing us how we're supposed to live this, how we are supposed to live in communion with God, how we are supposed to live in this. And so this series, Start Strong, like, as we're talking about these things, and I talked about, like, last week, if you were here, if you haven't caught it yet, here's the TLDR version. If you don't want to go back and watch it, it's basically... Basically just that Jesus calls us to be in communion with God every day. And so today I wanted to talk a little bit about what that looks like because like there's immense power if you are prepared, if you are ready, there's immense power available to you in the Lord. So I want to turn to, two, to one thing real quick. 
And then I want to talk, uh, we're, I'm going to bring somebody up here in a moment. And we're going to chit chat a little bit. But um, I want to turn to Ephesians with you. If you wouldn't mind jumping over there with me. And then uh, turn to Ephesians 6.10. It's the armor of God. Now, I know you've probably heard about the armor of God a bunch, but I just want to cover something like, like just picture this for a moment, like the things he uses, right? Like we'll kind of skip, skim through it quick. So like he starts talking about this stuff. He says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Look, armor is not something you put on to like go hang out and play video games like unless you're LARPing it's not like fun playtime gear so, like two people laughed so a couple of you know what LARPing is uh, and the rest LARPing is live action role playing it's like D&D &D with costumes and like throwing like I saw a whole documentary on it and there was a guy with like weighted handkerchiefs that were like his spells and he would be like I curse you with fire magic and he would like throw a red handkerchief at them and if he hit them then they like lost hit I don't know but so that was the thing and like I have friends who like go and Cody could explain it to you if you're one <laughs> okay um, so I've never been. I just, I don't know. It, uh, <laughs> some of the stuff is really, people get real into that. And some of it's like, wow, that's an impressive costume. And some of it's just like, you're like 45 and you live in your mom's basement. So, you know, it goes both ways. Um, but, uh, but so you put on all this armor to go into battle. There is a battle. There's a battle for your soul. There's a battle going on for the souls around you. The devil is looking to take you out. There are things that you are called to do, but without the proper equipment, you can't do it. And here's the thing about armor. Like, if I had a full suit of, like, medieval battle armor, and it's not quite on that level. Like, he's talking, like, Roman soldier kind of armor. Like, so if you've ever watched a piece from around, like, you know, 2,000 years ago, period piece, like some Roman army stuff or like gladiator, right? Like they got like the toga skirt and everything, but then also they got like some shin guard kind of sandals that are boots, right? And then they got all the things. And so that's, that's all the pieces of this it's going to talk about. So it says, put on the full armor of God so when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. It does not say when the day of evil comes, make sure you have an armor of God that you can throw on real quick. Sure, we can just go with that. Okay, what just happened? I'm super loud now. We could, we could turn that back down. All right, let's not push buttons anymore. Okay, um, somebody fell asleep on the soundboard. Whoa, sorry, just kidding. I don't know what happened, but it's all right. Thank you, sound people. You're wonderful. Um, I literally can't do this without them because you couldn't hear me, see? Um, well, you could, you could hear me. I'm loud enough, but it just it's better like this. I don't lose my voice as quick. Okay, so when the day of evil comes, put on the armor of God so that you're ready when the day of evil comes. So that like Jesus, you walk up and you're like, dang, there's evil. And if you're Peter, you left the armor in the other town and you're like, shoot, ah, I got nothing. Can I borrow like a stick or something? Like, that's my son. You can't poke him. Like, no, no, I wasn't going to. You got any other ideas, fellas? Like, he's got nothing. Jesus rolls up, and he's all armored up. And he's ready to go. Here's the armor of God. Put on the full armor of God, so when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, still, to remain standing. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place. So you put on the breastplate, this piece of body armor and you throw the belt around it, it holds it together, right? So you have a chest plate and a belt with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes with the gospel of peace. So that's those crazy like up armored sandals, right? And so you got like the crazy, it's like still a sandal, but it's got like metal plates all the way up to your knees. And then you have um, the shield of faith, which can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So you have a helmet, you have a sword and a shield you have a breastplate and you have a belt and you have boots that's like that's roman armor that's not like middle ages like i've come to slay the dragon like that's not that stuff it's not talking like 800 pounds of iron on you it's talking like a chest beat but like imagine like if i had all that stuff at home and somebody showed up right now and was like i challenge you to a duel and i'm like crap i gotta go home and get my stuff man i'm not ready it wouldn't work I get slaughtered. 
You got to be ready. That's what Jesus, that's what Paul is calling us to do here through the Holy Spirit as he's writing this. He's saying you got to be ready for this. If the devil's firing fiery darts at you, you don't get to be like, hold up, devil, pause. I'll be right back. I got the shield of faith at home. I'm going to go get it. Okay, I got it. I'm ready. Now go ahead. Shoot at me. I'm, I'm good. You got to have that with you. You have to have the shield of faith. You can't be like, oh, man, life's falling apart and the devil's attacking. I better get saved. That's not how this works. Amelia, why don't you come on up here? So look, all of this stuff, the way that this comes, like Jesus said, it comes through prayer. That's where you strengthen all of this stuff. That's how you acquire this, this armor. I'm going to give you this microphone, and I'm just going to snag. Can I get that one still on? Perfect. Does it have a bunch of effects on it? Do I? No. It just sounds cool. Ooh, I sound all bassy. Like, hey, everybody. Now we're going to... Sorry. I just... I like microphones. It's fun. Okay. So, um, Amelia is helping us start. Uh, do we announce it in the announcements, Cody? The prayer partners? Yeah. So, so, we're starting prayer partners. So, at the end of every service, you have the opportunity to come up and pray with people um, during communion. So, right when I'm done here in a few minutes, you will have the opportunity to come up, and there will be people standing at either side of the stage here, and you can receive prayer. If you like, man, I need somebody to pray with me. If you would like to join that team, don't worry, we'll even help you learn how to pray with people. It's not that hard, but, you know, it's nice to have a little bit of pointers. If I just, like, called somebody up, like, hey, anybody want to, like, do intercessory prayer for everybody else? You'd be like, no, uh, no. I can barely get most of you guys. <laughs> I'm like, anybody want to pray for this? Like, nope. I, literally, all you got to do is be like, hey, Jesus, thanks for that. Amen. And like, no, uh, I can't. I don't know what to say. Like, I just gave you, there's, like, six words. You can't. Amelia. So tell me a little bit. So I know, I know we're going to get to like the current time now, but like there was a time when, tell me about how your prayer life used to be. Like you, you told me a bit about that. And so like prayer was basically what? Um, yeah. So I was raised in a Christian household. So prayer was pretty much just something we did like before meals and before bed. And it was something I didn't really think about much. It's just like, oh, that's what you do. Right. It almost so. feels like it's like habit. It's like you put it, you set the table, you get the food on the plate, and then you're like, okay, thank you. Rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub, amen, and eat, right? <laughs> like you just, like it didn't really even mean anything. It's just like sort of obligatory, had to do a thing and say amen at the end of it, and then you yeah, can eat, exactly. right? Cool. So, so what, what changed that? Something happened in your um, life that you guys really stepped into a new category of prayer. Yeah, so when I was in fifth grade, my mom was diagnosed with stage four cancer. So that really hit us hard. Yeah. Because um, we've had some other health issues. Like that in our takes family. more than like a 30 second prayer before the meal, right? Oh, yeah. You know, just oh, like yeah. rub a dub dub, thanks for the grub, and heal mom. Okay, good, now let's eat. Yeah, like, and that that's was not a, how that works. A time Hopefully. Where God really um, tested our faith, tested our trust in Him. Um, and we started doing this thing as a family when we pray. Um, where we start out saying, thank you, God, I'm grateful for. So I know it was kind of cheesy at the time, but it's something that made us realize, hey, this is where God has blessed us in our lives. And there were a lot of different places okay. where we could point Okay, that so out. you just said so. that would be, that f seems kind of cheesy, but like, given that context, though, I feel like that would actually be a really hard thing. Like, was that hard at first when you were like, oh, yeah. you're like, mom has stage four cancer, like, if you don't know this, stage four is usually like, that's the last stage. Like stage four is like the next step is like we're going to work out hospice care and give you a lot of morphine and she's going to go peacefully. Like that, that's it. Like when you get stage four, that's like curtains out, like start picking out a casket. Like it doesn't just come back. You don't just get over that. And so, and so that's like some serious stuff. And that's hard. Like dad's a pastor. You guys go to Christian schools, you've been raised in a Christian household, you've been going to church forever, and now all of a sudden, like, your prayer has to mean something, and to start off with all of that, with all those questions, and then to, to start off with, thank you, God, that seems significant. It, yeah, it was really hard, because you just wanted to get to the part where it's like, oh, yeah, I'm praying for my mom, like, God, yeah, we're here, yeah, we've been faithful, like, we've been in, in Christian school, in the church, so why is this happening, but to take that time to find where God was blessing us in our lives like that yeah. was really something that we needed awesome um, to keep our trust in that time okay cool yeah. um so 
So then, so what, uh, so what would you say your prayer life looks like that? Like, do you still pray before meals in bed? And then like, how has that changed your kind of daily routine of prayer? Yeah. So, um, realizing what prayer was was something that really changed, um, my focus on prayer because like you're talking to God, you're talking to the creator of the universe who has all powerful and all sufficient. Like he's That's always kind of a there. big conversation probably. So yeah. Um, just you're not just like, what's up, man? <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, realizing that it's not just like, Oh, thank you. Amen. Like, that's really what changed it and that you can do it anytime. It's not like, oh, I have to wait till the meal time to pray for mom or right. I have to wait till I go to bed to pray for mom. But realizing mm. that at any time God's there listening and okay. he cares about you. So knowing so, that knowing that you're a teenager mm -hmm. and that like, you know, there's high school, there's, which yeah. comes with quite a bit of homework, right? And you do fairly well in school, right? So like you get your work done. And so there's a lot of that. You have friends. You hang out with friends and stuff. You do extracurricular things and all of that. So where do you find time to, like, pray, read your Bible, that kind of thing? Like, how do you make that part of it? Yeah, so this is something I kind of struggled with for a while. I was, I was just too overwhelmed with everything else. But I think it's uh, you have to make the time for it. Um, and the So time, where did you make time? The time where I found was in the mornings, just when I wake up. Because I felt like when you wake up, like most of the time you like grab your phone, you want to check the feed, you want to get ready for school and stuff. But um, I started waking up praying, waking up reading the Bible on a daily basis. And that really changes your lifestyle, even, even though it might just seem like, oh, reading in the morning. Like it comes to you throughout the day. And Absolutely. Um, the way you start off your day is the way your day goes pretty much. So. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. So, um, so part of that, uh, part of the reason I, w I wanted to bring Amelia up is like, like, I don't like what, what she's saying there, like, it doesn't sound that hard, right? Like, it sounds like something you can manage. Um, but, but the heart that how Amelia said, like, that's kind of transformed her a lot. Like, she came to us with kind of this idea of like, hey, I'd like to, you know, do that. Like, I really want to do this thing. And she's been really driving this prayer partners ministry um, forward in, in student ministries. And so I'm really excited to open that up. But like, it's not me going like, please, for the love of God, I need a teenager. Who would do it. Like, she was just like, yeah, I'd love to do that. And okay, so I worked up all the things. Like, here's so if you sign up and like you see the sheet and everything, like that's a lot of stuff that Amelia took the one for the adults and like worked it over for us, and it's awesome. And and she's gonna be leading that up for us. And she's just taking that step, that next step of going like, I've built more and more of my life around prayer, and now I want to be able to share that with others as well and use that as a ministry tool, not just as some way to be close to Jesus and feel good about myself. And so. So, so she's going to be doing that. So uh, awesome. I'll take that back. And then, thank you so much, Amelia. She'll be right up here if you want to, if you need to pray. Uh, I'm going to switch mics again. Okay. So she'll be up here if you want to, if you want to pray uh, at the end of service. But so I want to, I want to wrap that up with just a, um, a really simple uh, call from scripture. Matthew 6, um, Jesus talks about uh, how to pray. And he's talking about, like, things to do, things not to do. And he says, don't try to be flashy. Like, don't try to be impressive. Don't worry about trying to pray to make everybody super impressed with who you are. That's not what this is about. Start with the basics. Don't try to go all big either. Like, I read a, um, I read a biography of this really famous preacher about, like, what his week looks like. And this dude preached, like, four or five times a week. And he wrote each of those sermons the day he preached it. But he spent, like five, six hours prepping it, and like three of those hours were just prayer and study, like just straight up just like on his knees praying and reading the Bible, and like, dude, that's crazy. Like, I don't have that kind of time in my life, and I'm a pastor. I do this full time. There's no way you guys have time for that. So if I said like, okay, here's what it's going to take. You've got to read the entire book of Leviticus every morning, and, you know, you've got to pray like 800 things and do, you know, 5 million Our Fathers and 800 Hail Marys, or you're not going to be holy. Like, first of all, the type of prayer you do is not that important. It's more about you aligning your heart with God, seeking God's will, and, and opening up your ears, shutting up long enough to hear from him.
So we're going to talk about some other ways, like some, some different kind of creative ways, how to get into stuff that's individual next week. And then the following week, we'll talk about how to do it in community with others. Uh, but today, I just want to start with the basics. Reading your Bible and praying. And every other aspect of spiritual discipline. How do you start strong for the year? Develop these disciplines. Get into a habit, like Amelia said. Just wake up in the morning and open your Bible, even if it's just a few minutes. Just open it up, but don't do it without praying. Don't just read it and be like, okay, my eyes scan the page for 10 minutes. I must be good. But pray for a minute and just be like, God, just show me how my life should be different. Shape me through this. Just that prayer right there, just that simple thing. Isn't that simple? Like, you could all manage that. You open up your Bible, you go, God, shape me through what I read. And then read it. And just see what it starts to say to you. And then when you see something profound, don't just turn and, like, say a bunch of stuff. Just be like, wow, God, what do you want that to say? What do you want to say to me through this? Ask and just listen. If you need help on what to pray... Matthew 6, verses 9 through 13. Real simple. It's the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we, have sinned, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Just that. Just simple. Praise God a little bit. Seek his kingdom here on this earth. Be part of that. Ask where you fit into that. Seek what you need, not just everything you want. But God, give me my bread just so I can get through the day. Start small. Start easy. Go from there. Open up Matthew 6. Look at that and just try and put each line into your own words. And just pray that from your heart. God, you're pretty awesome. I know I don't always live right, but man, I want to see your kingdom do great things on this earth because I think it's better than what's going on here right now. I pray that you give me enough to get through the day so that I can live for you. Forgive me. I'm pretty bad at forgiving other people. But I know they, did, they don't deserve my grudge if you can forgive everything I've ever done. God, keep me away from the things that tempt me to sin and turn away from you. Protect me. Remind me to keep putting my armor on each day so that when the devil comes around, he can't get at me. Give me your righteousness over me. Give me that truth around me to hold me together. Give me the peace. Let me stand in peace, not turmoil and strife. Bring your gospel to mind so I remember the peace that it brings. Bring salvation to cover my mind and know that I am saved no matter what's going on. Give me a shield of faith. Let it be a shield that I would have faith in you even when I'm under attack. And give me a weapon, a powerful weapon, stronger than any two-edged sword, sharper than any blade known to man. The word, your spirit, bringing truth and dividing truth from lie. Let me bring truth into the battle, not pain and suffering and conflict, not inflicting injury, but bringing truth in your word. Give me a daily habit in your word and in prayer that when the time comes, Lord, I don't have to walk away unprepared saying, oh, I failed, I couldn't face it, but that I would be ready, fully armored up, able to step into it, Say, I'm prayed up. Let's do this. God, I know you died for us so that we would have this opportunity. We celebrate you in communion. And we lift up all that we are to you in Jesus' name.